Hear now these words, these words of power from the first chapter of the book of Genesis. This is the VMC translation. And God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle and all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and tend it. And be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw everything that God had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, and that was the sixth day. May God add understanding to the hearing of these words. Will you pray with me, please? May the Spirit of God be with us this morning. May the Word of God be heard in this place. May all the other words blow away like so much chaff on the wind. Amen. 
My friend Catherine and I accidentally wore the same dress to church on our confirmation day. It was a navy blue Laura Ashley with puffed sleeves and a lacy white sailor collar. We were twin portraits of comfortable mainline Protestantism. I have a photo. I remember giggling during the service of confirmation when we recited together the church covenant, which included a line about endeavoring to become a fruitful body of Christians. At 14, anything about bodies was equally mortifying and hilarious. I remember the dress, I remember the giggling, and I remember the new senior minister who'd arrived about a week prior. His name was David, and he turned out to be a really important person in my life. He let the youth group ask him anything we wanted. He didn't flinch at impertinent questions. He let me sit in his office and accuse the church of complacency. And he took me seriously. He also knew how to deliver a really good one-liner. I remember a kid asking him what he'd say to somebody who didn't believe in God. And David replied, Tell me about this God you don't believe in. Right. Now, I have used that line a time or two myself. Tell me about this God you don't believe in. It always leads to an interesting conversation. Sometimes I hear stories about a God who's a kind of cross between Santa Claus and Jack Nicholson's character in The Shining. Right? It's more common than you might think, actually. Apparently, there's a whole world full of Christian educators who believe scaring the pants off of children is a good way to cultivate a life of faith. It's amazing. Um, sometimes I hear stories that are full of grief, the kind of grief you feel when a long, loving relationship finally comes to an end. It's just too hard to imagine a loving God reigning over a world so full of pain and confusion. And after a while, that's all it feels like. Imagining. Plain pretend. And so, after a while, you just let it go. Over the next five weeks, Caroline and I will be answering the opposite question. We're going to tell you about the God we do believe in and why we think Christianity is a compelling way of life. The worship series is called Why Christian? Because we're beginning with the assumption that a case needs to be made. A case needs to be made for Christianity. According to the Pew Research Center, the fastest growing religious affiliation in the United States is none. None. One in five Americans who say they were raised in a church are no longer affiliated with one. And this trend is particularly evident among adults under 40 years old. The average nun is 36. If the trend continues, you can imagine the exponential effect of parents choosing not to raise their children in church. Right? Here's what gets me. Nearly half of Americans see no problem with that future that would be okay. Mm -hmm. Clearly, a case needs to be made for Christianity. 
I want to be really clear about something, though. I want to be really clear, so dial it back in if you're drifting. I have no interest, zero interest, in making the case for Christianity which codifies the abuse of power, which cultivates shame, which endorses white silence, which denigrates bodies, hushes up women, marginalizes the LGBTQ plus folks in our lives, or permits predators access to children. That church can die. Let's get out the shovel and help bury it. Let's bury it deep and let's move on. Let's move on to building something that looks, feels, sounds, and acts like the beloved community of regular people that Jesus called together. Friends, let's find better teachers. How about that? People like Dorothy Day and Dr. King and Oscar Romero and Richard Rohr. People like Rachel Held Evans and William Barber and Emily Towns, right? Teachers who know what love really looks like when it comes to the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's start there. Let's talk about love and what it looks like when love moves in down the block. Okay. Now, some people say Jesus is what love looks like in the neighborhood. He's the human embodiment of God's love. That's a good argument. We're going to dig into it in a couple of weeks, and we're going to see what kind of a case can be made for Jesus as God's love made flesh. But today, today we're digging way back into the family story, all the way back to Genesis to find the beginning of our life with God and to hear what love looked like at its inception. Now remember, the Bible isn't a book. It's a library, okay? And the book we're pulling off the shelf has that musty, velvety feel of ancient things. Deep mythopoetic history that we're reading. It's about the rising of land from the sea and the beginning of light. Mm -hmm. Imagine our ancestors telling these stories, memorizing them, and singing them with neighbors gathered in close thousands of years ago. Okay. We are calling on old old wisdom when we open this book. So let's hold it gently and listen well. And God said, let us make a human in our image. And God created the human in God's image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And made fish and flying things and crawlers and creepers, too. And God saw all that God had done. And look, it was very good. Very good. It's a love song. It's an ancient love song. Singing the goodness of creation. Love breaking loose in a human body. Let us make it human in our image. The Creator births one who can create. The source of love breathes life into us so that we too may love. We're made in love by the God who is love for the purpose of love, right? So let's sing with those ancient ones. We have a name. The song gives us our name. Beloved, we are for loving. miraculous. And it's the truest thing about us. We, we are what love looks like when it comes to the neighborhood. And we have a name, Beloved. Maybe you grew up knowing that name. I hope you did. 
Maybe you've been well-loved all your life and never had a reason to doubt your belovedness. But just in case, just in case no one ever told you, I want you to know how very, very beloved you are. You are stardust and water mixed together by a loving hand. Your body, your spirit, your heart, your love, God saw all that. And look, it was very good, so good. You are very good. The fiber of your being is very good. The weave of your spirit is very good. And you are so, so loved. It's the truest thing about you, beloved. If the church or somebody in the church ever told you otherwise, I am so sorry. If somebody in the church hurt you or abused you, I am so sorry. That should not have happened. It wasn't right, and it wasn't love. It should not have happened. On behalf of the church, I sincerely apologize. I believe in a God who loves us bigger than we can imagine, no matter what. A God who longs to hold us close and heal our hearts and make us whole. I serve a church where that God shows up on a regular basis. It is such a joy. If you've given up looking for God in church, I get it. And I'd like to ask you to let me and Caroline make the case that God may not be done with us yet. You see, I believe there's more love and more light that's just waiting to break forth from us yet to burst into our neighborhood and make all things new. I can't wait to see what that's going to look like. Thanks be to God.